Okay, so talk about how we should talk to the boys and girls then the, the same way. Yeah. Does everybody deserve a choice before somebody ever touches them sexually? Yes. Yes. Teach both genders that. Mm -hmm. You and your partner always deserve a choice. Mm -hmm. Do you deserve for intimacy to be wonderful? Yes. All genders deserve that. So there's really no need for gender discussion in mm -hmm. here. All males deserve to have their boundaries respected. All females deserve to have their boundaries respected. As soon as you say, you know what, let the guy ask. Let the guy make the moves. You've just taught your child their partner should make all the decisions. And their job is to stop it. Hmm. Not to be able to actually have a voice. I don't even want to talk about making out because then that's just the bridge or the next step for them to being too intimate. You yeah, know? you know, Tiffany, this is one of the biggest fears parents have, and yeah. it's completely unfounded. And here's why. If you don't give your teenager a skill set because you think, well, if I give them the skill, they're going to want to implement It'll it right away. Far. The problem is they're getting it already. Mm -hmm. They're getting it from TV, their friends, and if they get curious and they're not getting it from those sources, they'll turn to the internet. This is a horrible source. Horrible. <laughs> All research shows the more you talk to your children, they are more likely to slow down and engage in intimacy at a later age because they understand the whole picture mm -hmm. instead of this one little narrow thing they're hearing from their friends or the media. So one of the things we want every parent to think about out there is, am I teaching my daughters and my sons about sexual decision making, gender equality, the same way. Am I teaching my son and my daughter, you should ask if you want to kiss someone. Am I teaching my son and my daughter that sexual, being a sexual person is natural and it's healthy and it's positive and you should feel good about yourself. Now, it takes a lot of things for sexual activity between two people to truly be wonderful. It takes a lot of certain steps and you want to go over those steps with your kids, but they should be the same steps for males and females, for anyone of any gender. And that's really important to, to start to knock out this hostility of this opposite gender concept. If it's almost like a battle between genders, it should never be that. It should be two people getting to know each other, their boundaries, what they like, what they don't like, regardless of gender. Using humor as a hook, Mike Domish gets into a topic. Hands on my leg, yes, she wants me. That's no laughing matter. We teach three main skill sets. One, how to ask first before engaging in sexual intimacy. Two, how to intervene when you see somebody using alcohol at a party to facilitate a sexual assault. And then three, how to open the door for survivors. So you also talk to adults, people of all ages, folks in the military. How do they perceive your message? Are they open to it? Do they think, I, I get it, I'm 55 years old? Or <laughs> you know what's funny is all ages, they love the approach because they're like, you know what, even at 55 and I'm dating, I see these same ridiculous assumptions and games being played that were played when I was 15. To actually have a simple strategy, a simple skill set makes my dating at 55 that much more safer and fun. Get rid of all the games and all the stupidity that happens in those situations. Get right to the point. Uh, it's an act of dominance by, by men, you know, and that's the, the status quo of sex in this country. Um, and if we ch shifted that to, you know, sex is normal and uh, sex is great and something that everybody should enjoy, um, we might actually see these communication issues really uh, not solve themselves, but they would be, become a, wouldn't be embarrassed about it anymore. You know? You're 100% uh, correct. And one of the things that we address with people is this exact issue, that we can't really have a cultural transformation that's going to end sexual violence if we're not teaching healthy sexuality. If you don't have something to actually pursue that is good and positive, then you're going to stay doing what you currently do. We have to give people a new way to look at sexuality. In other words, sex is not about getting some. Sex should be, when you engage with it in another person, it should be about two people having a mutually wonderful, amazing experience. But, but he's right that our country has a stigma when it comes to talking about sex. I mean, we've had, you know, people that will say, well, we can't bring this into a high school because if you talk about how to ask for a kiss, kids might want to start having sex, which is an insane concept to think of. Students say the direct opposite. High school students say if we actually asked, before we engaged in intimacy, abstinence would go way up because we would recognize we're not ready yet to be having these conversations. We're extremely uncomfortable with them, and it would have us slow down. And it would give us a better goal to go after as far as it being about both people being comfortable, wanting it, and being something wonderful and special.
but are there things that women can do to protect themselves? And, and you really said no. Yeah, here's the thing. One of the biggest mistakes we make, parents make this mistake all the time, is they tell their children ways not to be sexually assaulted. Mm -hmm. Well, there's only way, one way to truly not be sexually assaulted, and that's to not have somebody be a perpetrator or a rapist. So instead of focusing your kids on what not to do to be sexually assaulted, you should teach your kids how to have healthy intimacy. Mm -hmm. Teach your kids they have boundaries. Speak up about their boundaries. Teach your kids how to ask for what they want and what they don't want in sexual intimacy. Teach them how to use their words to have more of a choice in situations regarding sexual activity. Is it sometimes surprising how many people are really <laughs> victims of this? Well, here's the thing. The response is wonderful because uh -huh. nobody's talking about this. When you look at, even at sex education, most people tell students what not to do and what not to get. Mm. And what we do is we come in and say, let's teach you an actually positive skill set for how to talk about what you want, what you don't want intimacy. And by doing that, we're going to greatly reduce sexual assault. And so it's fun, it's interactive, there's role playing, and they learn a new wow. way to approach things. Wow, okay, I love it. So Mike, we, we typically have you start off by you giving us the foundation, and how I really like to set that up is, can you name a time in your life where you really identified that defining moment that made you go, this is it, and this is why I need to do the work today. And if you could kind of walk us through what happened at that time and how it led you to do the amazing work you do today, Mike. Oh, well, thank you. Yes, uh, I can remember the moment. There were actually two things that occurred. For everybody watching who may not be aware, I'm the brother of a survivor. So my sister was sexually assaulted in 1989. I was in college at the time, and I was struggling so much with my life that I transferred universities to be back home near my sister during the trial. And so I was sitting in the gymnasium at the University of Wisconsin Whitewater as a student athlete. We were mandated to go hear a speaker on sexual assault. This speaker was Joseph Weinberg. I sat there and I thought, hey, He's talking about this. I could talk about this. This is what I should do. This is, and I was, I was angry. I was a pissed off brother at the time, but I was, and it was ruining my, I went from um, an honor student to almost probation, or was on probation for a semester, and it was messing up my life, and I realized, wait, wait, this is the way I can have a voice. And so I went to that speaker that day and said, if somebody wanted to do this, what would it take? And he said, you come to my place. I'll be happy to give you any information you want. I got lucky. He was only living a year, an hour away, even though he's a national speaker. That was the turning point right then and there. I'm, I'm actually a, a sexual assault victim. I just want to say thank you. It, I really, today especially, I really needed to hear someone having positive conversations about consent and sexual decision making. And thank you. <laughs> well, one, no, thank you, because every time. A survivor like yourself speaks out and says, as a survivor, all of us get to see the strength and the courage that all survivors such as you have, and that is a great role model for everybody out there. So thank you for sharing with us. You know, the reason we do this work is because we're continually inspired by survivors. It started because of my sister's strength and courage, and, and every day we continue to be inspired by other survivors in the military and schools that we meet. So thank you, Mel.